In May of 2018, I was attending the alumni week and commencement at Westminster Choir College, where I spoke with a fellow alum, Susan Cherry. I asked what she was doing at the time, fully expecting her answer to be a music related career. Instead, she told me she was running a restorative justice center in Vermont, and I was enthralled, especially having just taken several classes on racism from Sue Linderman. Since that time, I had thought about how amazing it would be to have Susan give a class for us at Westminster Presbyterian Church to enhance our understanding of the amazing possibilities of restorative justice, to improve the lives of those impacted by conflicts and some crimes, and to re reduce recidivism. Now in the time of COVID, the opportunity to Zoom has been a silver lining in an otherwise devastating year. And I am so pleased to have Susan with us. She indeed began with a career in music, teaching K through eight music in local public schools in Vermont. Eventually, she received her Vermont principal's license and was hoping to be part of system change in Vermont schools. She is now a trainer throughout Vermont for restorative practices and is the founding director of the Summer Institute for Restorative Practices and the executive director of the Community Restorative Justice Cent Center, which is in St. John's, St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Both in the school and in the community at large, Susan still has her focus on changing systems to reflect base, basic principles of restorative justice and practice. Susan, thank you for being with us this evening to teach us a little bit more about what you do. And I think it really can be life-changing if this sort of thing could be implemented in so, the so many ways that you do this in Vermont. So we're thrilled to learn. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I feel like I'm among friends already. It's, uh, it's a lovely way to, uh, to gather in the evening, and um, let's see, is my voice loud enough for you? Is it okay? All right. Good for I'm going to um, share my screen and uh, take you through a couple of slides that uh, might help us look at what uh, we're talking about with restorative justice and, and how we got started actually implementing that uh, within the uh, state of Vermont. Uh, but I would love to hear questions as we go along. If I don't see you because of this particular format, uh, if you put something in the chat um, so that you don't forget that you want to ask that question, we'll certainly get back to it. Or if you interrupt me, I will stop and we'll, we'll have that conversation. But I certainly think we'll leave enough time at the end where I'll take this uh, large interruption to our relationship building boxes uh, out of the way and we can uh, see each other and have that conversation. But I wanted to just share with you that uh, Sandy had sent a report from Delaware I shared it with one of my colleagues and I asked him the question. So, so John, um, and this is John Perry, who has written quite a bit on restorative justice and the work in Vermont. I said, does this remind you anything of how we were looking at our problems uh, back in the 1990s in Vermont? And it, uh, he got excited, he said, let's talk. And so we, we just renewed our um, conversation about what did it look like in Vermont and what were the major steps that we had taken in order to see some change in some of the systems. So that's, that's the, the basis for this particular presentation that I'm sharing with you today. The main focus uh, that happened in Vermont is that we had uh, an issue in, um, in the early 90s, not unlike a lot of folks, that said we, um, we had some bad media around the criminal justice system. A lot of the uh, reports not really um, 
very much in favor of what was happening in the criminal justice system. They just couldn't put their finger on where the problem was. Um, they would see what they called catch and release, people who were um, going in front of the court, uh, but yet back on the streets within a short period of time. And they said, uh, you know, you know what's, what is it that we need? Madeline Kunin was our governor at the time. And she said, well, the biggest problem that we have here in the state of Vermont is that we don't have a constituency that understands uh, the criminal justice system, nor have we ever asked for their input into how we run our systems. So the state of Vermont decided to hire John Doble, who had recently done a report for the state of Alabama uh, around 1985 or so. And he had said to the folks in Alabama, you know, people don't like the way things are going here. This is what people want. And unfortunately, Alabama did not change anything based on the survey. And we had recognized that in Vermont and said, well, let's really, let's ask the people, but let's be sincere about it and find out what the people really want. So the survey was done in 1991 and the results of the survey are in front of you. Very clearly, the public wanted safety from violent predators, accountability for violators of the law, they wanted people to repair any damage that was done. They wanted to make sure that whatever people were coming back into in their community, that they had some knowledge or treatment or some kind of understanding of how to do better and not repeat the offense. But they also wanted the community to be involved. And this was a surprise to those in state agencies, as you can imagine. But they also wanted somebody overlooking the quality and efficiency of the programs. So when you look at, if you're changing a system as large as the Department of Corrections, you're really looking at two levels of change. You would have to change how people are taken into the Department of Corrections. So on the front end, how, how do people enter this particular system. And you also have to look at how do people exit that particular system. So in order to look at the intake, you have to, if you're looking at reducing incarceration, you're looking at also um, how do we take care of not incarcerating those that don't need to be incarcerated? And what system are we going to have? Again, looking at, you know, the, 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 the problem of, you know, um, how do we assure safe release, right? Um, so not just, uh, we're not going to incarcerate and we're not gonna have supervision, but how do we assure the public that, that people in their communities are going to be safe? Also the judges, it's not that they were making poor choices, they didn't have enough choices. So we needed to give the judges more choices. And they, the three places where people were looking were things called community justice, restorative justice, and reparative justice. And, and believe it or not, there's a little bit of a difference. Um, my center is called the Community Restorative Justice Center. And our boards are reparative boards. But what's interesting about that is that the community justice comes from the involvement of the community where the incident happened to be part of a conversation about how that incident needs to be repaired. It's not relying on the hierarchical structures to say we trust the people in government to tell us what they think is gonna be safe for our communities. It's actually involving the communities in deciding how they want the safety to look. Restorative justice is very critically different when you talk about what does the person who was harmed want? Very direct contact with the people who were directly affected by whatever incident, crime, or criminal activity, um, or any kind of um, incident of harm occurred. 
So the person who did the harm, we call the responsible party. And the people who were directly affected by the harm, we call the affected parties. And then secondarily to the affected parties are the community members because there's no non-victim crime. In some way or other, all community members are affected by what happens in the community. Whether it's what they read about it in the newspaper, they see somebody who's swerving on the road or something is going on in their community that's suspicious, they have a layer of uh, response, which generally responds in fear and generally is um, alienating to being able to do something in a response to what they're seeing or what they're hearing. Community justice involves the community members and invites them into that conversation about what does the community want and need in order for there to be community safety. So restorative really is around victim, community is around the community, reparative is around how does the person who did the harm repair what was broken, fix what needs to be fixed. Look at the relationships, including the community relationships and respond to the community and ultimately to the authorities, how am I going to make this right? So we looked at some of the furlough and sentencing options within the state of Vermont, and we decided to go the direction of community supervision. So we would be reducing the intake, we'd have community furlough and community supervision, rather than keeping people in the facilities until they max out, and then there's no oversight and the community has no say in, um, in anything that is going on with them. On the outside end, when people are released into the community, the constituency gets involved at our center. We have a community justice center that supports the work of COSA. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Co COSA, but it's circles of support and accountability. <clears throat> A COSA is where the community members meet with somebody, and we usually have three per COSA, coming back into the community out of incarceration. They meet once a week for an hour for at least a year. And during that hour, once a week for at least a year, and some of our COSAs don't want to end, they build relationships. They learn how to repair harm. They learn from people who are community members how they solve issues that they're confronted with. So it's a form of mentoring, but it's more just that, how does that conversation invite really transparent um, understanding of some human values and human connection. So more on that in just a little bit. Um, we needed many volunteers. So we started asking, who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you know? Um, the first layer was, you know, if we're going to do this in our communities, who do you respect in your community that you would trust their judgment as far as the safety and as far as holding people accountable and being just? So we got a list of names. We sent them all letters and said to them, who do you know in the community that would like to be part of a reparative board and a community justice process? And many of them said, I would, let, 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 me, let, me, let me join. So our first reparative boards uh, were involved by just really asking community members and asking people, who do you know? To this day, 20 years later, 25 from the first uh, rep board, um, most of our volunteers come because their friends say, listen, this is making a difference. You gotta join, you gotta, you gotta work with us. The other really big piece of community justice is the collaborations and the system change from just relying on one system of justice to having more partners at the table to say the collaborations are much deeper and much broader than simply who's in that sequential intercept model. We have relationships with housing 
uh, providers. We have relationships with uh, recovery centers. So people who are coming back into the community who need support in their uh, path of recovery can find that and we connect them with job access um, and other community action supports. So this is an interesting slide because John Doble compiled a lot of information from that constituency and found out that, you know, who did you really trust to make good decisions for justice? And um, ultimately they said our neighbors, you know, the people we know, we trust them more than anything. And, and of course the only inroad that folks had for being part of the justice system at the time um, were the, and you can probably move that picture box a little bit up in the way, um, you know, were the jury trials and what people, you know, may not be aware of, but uh, less than 2% of cases that go into court actually end up with a jury trial. So even though justice, according to the constituency, was really, you know, trusted to their neighbors, um, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for that to happen. Interestingly enough, um, lawyers are way down on the list, but DOC was even lawyer that, uh, lower than the lawyers. Uh, people, the Department of Corrections had no credibility, you know, which is interesting because, you know, they only do what they're told, but they were the ones on the front end of, you know, what do people see? They see the Department of Corrections, you know, releasing them into the community. And so they were getting the brunt of all the media attention. So the neighbors, they said, well, here's what neighbors should look at. Um, you know, are they repairing what was broken? Are, are they returning what was stolen? Are they fixing what was damaged? And, and building relationships in the community matters. Um, there's an interesting book that I really enjoy, and I, I share it when I do my training for teachers in the classroom. Um, it's a Donald Nathanson, is a Dr. Donald Nathanson, and his writings have been um, sort of broadcast through the Tompkins Institute. But he talks about the, the compass of shame and how if you manage shame, you also uh, prevent violence. One of the things that Nathanson talks about is that when you um, have a disruption to your positive affect, so something's going wrong in your life, you act out in a way that is in one of four compass points, either harming self, harming others, withdrawing, or actually you know, uh, avoiding or um, you know, doing uh, some kind of self-medication um, or to, to pull you away from any pain that you have. Shame separates people from their community. When people know they've done wrong, the first thing that gets lost are the relationships. Because as all of you who have had children know, if a child has done something wrong, the first thing they do is run and hide and then when you bring them out, their head is low, no eye contact, they don't wanna confront you. But if you wanna take the next door to, to say, I'm sorry to Mr. Smith because I threw that, that baseball through your um, basement window, um, you know, it's like, what do you think we need to do? You know, oh, we need to go talk to Mr. Smith. And, and as soon as you give them ideas of how they can repair any damage, their head starts to come up a little because you're, you're showing them a way forward out of that shame. And when somebody has done something wrong in the community, there aren't a lot of avenues of parenting that actually give them a path forward to repair the harm, to fix what was broken, to return what was stolen. The punishment is about you need to feel what it's like to be broken yourself. Therefore, we're going to punish you so you know what it feels like. And that in itself, over time, we've studied this, does not actually make a person a better person. If you send Johnny to his bedroom and you go and talk to Mr. Smith about the broken window, what does Johnny learn? 
But if you take Johnny next door and show him how to repair that window, and Johnny says, I think this looks better than, than what it did before even, you know, dad, we, we did a good job. You taught me how to glaze the window. Let's put a coat of paint on it. And then, and then Johnny notices that the other windows in the basement are also losing their glazing. And he does one more thing and he fixes that. Well, what does Mr. Smith do? He says, Johnny, you did a good job. That's a critical piece of restorative justice to say, hey, you did a good job. I recognize that you repaired the harm. Where do we do that? Does the newspaper ever share that somebody made things right? Not usually, because the culture in our society right now is they have to pay for the wrong. They have to be really punished, otherwise they're not paying, right? And, and the, the truth of the matter is that when Johnny is given a chance to not only repair what was what was wronged, repair what was broken, he got a chance to repair the relationship. Now, if Johnny were sent to his room, Mr. Smith would look out the window when Johnny was going to school and say, there goes that juvenile delinquent, that no good. He's not up to any good. What's he up to now? He never even said, I'm sorry. But because Johnny did a good job, and he started to hold his head up a little higher. And Mr. Smith said, good job, nicely done. Then when Mr. Smith goes to Hawaii, <laughs> he says, Johnny, can you take care of my mail? Can, can, you, can you take care of my cat? Can you take care of, and Johnny does. And he, the relationship is built. And when Johnny goes down the street, he says, look at that good looking young man. He's gonna amount to something. Where do we do that in our community? Good parenting, just plain good parenting. Our society says that, you know, the equilibrium of justice, those scales of justice, those iconic scales of justice, the little dotted justice says in our criminal justice system. So if you look at the little dots, the, the, the person who did the offense, the offender in this, in this graphic, we have to put him below, we have to punish him so he's below that equilibrium. Bring him down because the victim was brought down. Um, in restorative justice, the offender is responsible for repairing and bringing the victim up. I think of that equilibrium. Rather than putting somebody down, you're responsible to bring them up. So that's really a difference in the way that you look at a whole criminal justice system. Not restore, not uh, retributive justice, but restorative justice. What we're talking about here is changing the paradigm. There is a rec reciprocity that has to happen. When Johnny and Mr. Smith began to give and take with each other, maybe it started with a good morning, Mr. Smith. Good morning, Johnny. That reciprocity back and forth is shared. When I give you something, you feel like, oh, I wanna do something for them. And, and that's that reciprocity that when the government does everything for the individual or takes care of the individual or puts the individual behind bars because they're taking care of everybody, um, it really does not allow for the natural order of reciprocity, which is integral to our community relationship building. Now, if instead of the government creating policy, which categorically provides all the services to our individuals, they resource information to communities and community government and leaders so that they can measure the outcomes. Their job is to give technical assistance. Their job is to provide that guidance and technical assistance and resources, resources being monetary as well, as well as information. But that can't happen unless the community communicates what they need 
to the government. Again, that reciprocity. The community in turn uses those outcomes and technical assistance and information and resources in order to provide services to family members. Activities, work, providing school. The community can't do that to its full effectiveness unless they hear from families, what do you need? So if the family units are able to communicate to the community, what do we need? What do we see as our school's ability to meet my family needs for education? And then the community supplies that, but also relays that need to the government. And we're seeing this right now. We have all this money coming from the federal government to our states and to our local um, government entities. If we don't hear from the community how we think this is gonna be spent, we are not changing that paradigm. It's being involved, it's getting people involved that really changes that paradigm. The community supports the family, which nurtures, supports, and loves the individual. So this is rather a radical paradigm, but it's part of what our community justice system can be situated to be able to do. That kind of reciprocity works best when the interactions are frequent, when favors are visible, the favors are valued, there becomes a history of reciprocity and there's a mechanism to detect that it's not working. One of the best ways that we learn from anthropologists about holding communities together and helping people feel like they belong within a community is storytelling and ritual. In our circles that we hold at the Community Justice Center, we believe that circle can be a ritual where we talk with people about what are their needs. Uh, when our offenders meet with their COSA team, we talk about things that are deep, that are part of relationship building in our communities. When there's a conversation about racism and diversity and equity, we pull people into a circle. I just built a yurt so I could, I could have social distancing and, and, and gather people together in a circle. It's about gathering people together and how do we do that in a way that invites participation, not telling people what they're going to receive, but involving that or inviting that reciprocity. An authoritative way or authoritarian way of responding to the criminal justice system or any kind of system is the, the, you know, doing something to somebody, right? Our retributive criminal justice system does two. It's that paradigm that says it's our responsibility to, to decide what happens to this person. It's justice. Um, on the other hand of what we often have seen in our, um, human service agencies is that we've often seen in, in perhaps past years more than now, our human service agencies doing four. And, you know, let me fill this out for you. Let me take care of you. Let me house you. Let me give you this. Let me give you that. Restorative justice and community justice is about doing with. That we've, we don't feel that we're really serving people appropriately unless they're involved in the conversation. So when we're having a reparative panel meeting, the people who are in the circle are the community members, the person who did the harm, the responsible party, the people who are directly affected, the victims, and the people who saw what was going on. So we often invite law enforcement into the circle because if we have a situation where somebody was um, really impaired during their um, arrest, they often don't remember. Some of the most powerful conversations that we've had were when the responsible party looked up at the police officers and said, I'm really sorry that you saw me doing that. That's really not who I am. And for the police officer to look at that person and say, I can see that now who never had that opportunity. We don't give people in court the opportunity 
to hear stories and provide that, that safe ritual experience where people can actually say their truths without worrying about somebody hearing something that's going to jeopardize uh, a future condition of their freedom. So in our cases, what they say in our circle has no bearing on any kind of conviction. We will see cases that um, will come to us ahead of any kind of conviction. So law enforcement might send us cases. Uh, we call that a direct referral. And if they complete their agreements with the community that we make with the victims and everybody together, and they come back in about three months and they've done everything, then we send it back to the law enforcement agencies and say, successfully completed. And then we, we put something in the paper that says, and they rebuilt that fence and they restored and repaired that windshield. And they also took care of um, painting um, the fence that they, they pulled down. If it is a criminal conviction and it goes to court, the judge will say, in order for you to really fully repair the damage, I want you to go before the Restorative Justice Center. So they come to us post conviction as a condition of their probation in order to repair the harm. So they can say anything they want to. They can say all of the truth that the victim never heard in court, which is sometimes what the victim really, really wants to hear. There is a process that we often talk about when we're looking at the, the corner of with. How do you do something with? And it's something I took from a state that uh, a, um, a writing by um, Kim and Malborn from Australia. And uh, they talk about three pieces that make for a fair process. Uh, the first piece is engaging. And I, I think of that as asking people, you know, what is your story? What happened? The explanation. So everybody has a shared understanding of what went on. So we ask the question, what were you thinking about at the time? What have you thought about since? Who was affected by what you did? How are they affected? How do you think you need to make things right? And then we ask the, the victim, the people who are directly affected, what's been the hardest thing for you? What do you think needs to happen to make things right? And then we create an agreement together. We write it up, they sign it, and everybody understands what's expected of them through this agreement. When they come back and they haven't done it, our community members and our panel are generally okay with saying, well, how much more time do you need to get this done? Do you see how important this is? You know, and, and sometimes the victim will be there in person and sometimes our victim advocate will be there to stand in but the victim advocate has always had that conversation with the victim, the people who are directly affected by this harm. And, and often there'll be a statement, um, you know, a, a victim impact statement. And uh, if, if somebody had a driving offense, we generally suggest that they go through our safe driving class that we hold here. Uh, sort of like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. It's a, a class that we've developed um, that helps people understand the impact of the contract being broken, the social contract being broken when people are on the road. And we have people who have suffered tragedies in their family due to impaired drivers and they tell their story. And the people in the class listen to the story and they ask questions. It's one of the most powerful uh, experiences to hear from people and have people think about, I could have really, you know, done something horrible and, and I never want to be that person. So we often ask, what, what is it that you know that we want us to know about you that we don't know yet? And, and get them to talk about themselves and we help them to find out, you know, what they can contribute back to their communities. So we were at this crossroads in Vermont, right? Either we could build our way out and build more jails, 
or we could involve the community. And because it was a money issue, our, our governor and our legislators said, well, that's an easy solution. You know, it's the way you present things, right? Do you wanna increase your budget 200% or do you wanna involve the community? And so they said, let's, let's involve the community, let's do it. So what do we have to do? Um, what we really did is we looked at our Vermont constitution, which was really interesting because we had a place in our Vermont constitution that said that somebody who um, you know, needed to repair harm to the community could be sentenced to hard labor. Well, that sort of gave us an in and said, well, that means community service. You know, let's, let's have the community say what that looks like. You know, that, that's that way. And uh, involving the victim, as I, I mentioned. Um, so a collaborative community, right? Com collaborative community justice is not the same as authoritarian justice. Um, so we, we looked, I mean, we had some wonderful people in Vermont at the time that were really, they loved research. If you can find people who love to do research and love to find the facts and figures, that's who we had in Vermont. They went to uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. They interviewed people um, and looked at particularly at the indigenous systems of justice because they were seriously community justice systems. And they, um, they went all over the state talking with people, uh, holding community forums. Uh, they, and, and as they were going through this, they, they were videotaping some of these forums. And uh, they asked for the, you know, given all these choices, uh, would you rather have people just locked up when they do a crime? Or are you interested in having the community involved in, in reparative probation? 92% of the people who were asked that question said, no, no, we want the community involved. John Doble came back to us and he said, there's just not that much favorable response for when you ask people if they like ice cream. I mean, this was big. <laughs> this was really big. And so we, we went back to um, our legislature and we went back to the governors and we said, then we need to really go big. All right, we need to do a complete overhaul. Um, at that point um, in around 1992-93, um, they wrote all the job descriptions, completely new job descriptions uh, for everybody in DOC. They were no longer under the Division of Public Safety. They became um, a division or department of the Agency of Human Services. They decided that a DOC was no longer uh, in charge of the punitive, they were in charge of the restorative. We were no longer going to wait until somebody maxed out, we were gonna have community furlough so that people could practice being a community member while they were still under supervision, get their housing while they're still under supervision, they have community eyes on them and get their benefits in place, get figured out how they were gonna get a job, figure out how they were going to be a responsible, positive contributing member to their community. And that's where our COSAs come in as well. So we got a grant to do the complete overhaul, new job descriptions, a new way of running things. And we had our first reparative board in the state of Vermont in 1995. It got the attention of a lot of people uh, down in Dartmouth, uh, which is not too far from us. And so one of the biggest ways of uh, academia looking at how we were doing this is we held one of our reparative boards in sort of a fishbowl. We took a real case and we put them in the center of a fishbowl and all the, we had about 25 professors watching this happen. They were so sold on this that Dartmouth started instituting a restorative class in their criminal justice system. Now the state of Vermont has the first uh, um, restorative justice program at the Vermont Law School. They have a degree, a master's in restorative justice. And uh, we also are uh, uh, now have the federal um, center for restorative justice, which uh, our Senator Patrick Leahy uh, was able to secure at the Vermont Law School. In 1999, um, our John Perry and John Gorsuch, our two researchers, uh, went down to the press club in Washington, D.C., the National Press Club, 
and they were competing for the Ford Foundation Prize. It wasn't a prize to get a program, it was a prize to get publicity for the program. And they won the prize. And it attracted visitors from around the world. Um, people came from Japan, they came from Korea, they came from, um, uh, one of our biggest visitors was Tanzania. Uh, we had the chief justice from Tanzania that came to see what was going on. And uh, he took a tour of what was happening in Vermont, spent a couple of weeks with us. And he said, you know, in Tanzania, we, we went all out. We have the state of the art um, penal system. We really, we built brand new prisons. We have brand new courtrooms. We have beautiful you know, places for people to walk into. It's really the state of the art. He said, but I have to tell you, this reminds me of what was going on, you know, parallel to us developing the state of the art penal system in Tanzania. He said, when I, when I went back uh, at one point after getting all of these things established, I had to go back to my village um, to uh, attend a funeral. And he said, I was on this bus going over dusty roads back to my village. And there was somebody coming out of the correctional facility that was also on that bus. So the bus stopped outside the village and one of the elders of the village um, called the, the re-entering community member out of the bus and they had a conversation. So this chief justice was curious about that and asked the elder later said, what's, what's going on? And he noticed that this gentleman's family members went out to meet him and they brought a tent, they brought food, they welcomed him back and they told him all about what was gonna be happening the next day. So this young man spent the night in his tent, well fed, welcomed home, but not completely. The next day, there was a large circle and all of the members of the community were gathered in the circle and they wanted to hear his story. What happened? What have you been thinking about? What do you want to do to make things right? And all around the circle, people told him, this is what we need from you in order to trust you. This is what we need to see you do. This is what we need to see you achieve. This is who we need to see you be. And he heard it from his friends and his neighbors, and he agreed. And after a long conversation and another meal, they shook his hand and said, welcome home. We're so glad that you're here. And the chief justice from Tanzania said, it didn't matter that we created an amazing penal system, state of the art. What really matters is how do we welcome people back into our community from separation? How do we say we understand, but we're glad you're back. You're one of us, welcome home. So in our reparative panels, we ask the person to tell their story. Make sure that the needs of the victims are addressed. The needs of the community are addressed. How was, did the crime impact the community? How did it impact other people? How are we gonna learn ways not to do this again? It's what the community needs to hear. It's what we need to know in order for us to trust this person back into the community and say, welcome home. We started doing circles of support and accountability after studying the indigenous folks of um, the Mennonite community and some indigenous justice in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, they waited until folks were maxed out of their sentence. And then they, the church wrapped their services around somebody coming back, mostly around sex offenders. Um, when somebody maxes out their sentence uh, and they're coming back into the community and if they're not under supervision, then nobody's looking at them. And the church said, you know, we, we, you know, we wanna be able to say to this person, 
um, look, we'll, we'll walk this walk with you, but we want you to be able to prove to us that we can trust you, but we're gonna walk with you in this. And so they held these Kosa circles um, every week. And that's how we learned how to do that from the Mennonite church in Canada. When you're thinking about the steps for restorative justice, you're looking at how to repair, how do you restore, what does the reconciliation look like, but more importantly, what does the reintegration look like? When I teach this in the schools, I talk about various tiers. Uh, the tier one, uh, anybody who's a teacher, you might be uh, talking about the uh, multiple tiered system of supports. There, there's a system of supports in place for people who are not able to make it in the classroom and you need to have those behavioral supports in place. What I've turned that into is how are you welcoming people into your community and your classroom learning community in a way that gives them the opportunity to tell their story. And when some harm does happen, how are you welcoming them to be able to repair that harm and to be able to come back into the community with the community welcoming them uh, as part of their learning community. So everybody has responsibilities, right? If you think about the changing the paradigm, we all have responsibilities in this. The community has responsibilities. The people who did the harm has responsibilities. Um, I'm working on a new chart that says the government has responsibilities. And, you know, how do we really hold people accountable for doing their part. So is the person gonna acknowledge and take responsibility, say they're sorry, repair the damage, fix the broken, return the stolen, clean up the mess, right? But how are they also gonna learn how to become a valuable contributing member to their community? And it requires the community's responsibility to say, this is what we need. This is what we need to observe you doing. We need to, facilitate somehow that conversation. Where does that conversation happen? Our conversations happen here at the Restorative Justice Center. We have 18 of them throughout the state of Vermont. It's a part of our government structure that says we trust the community. We've made studies. We have those studies now in report form if anybody wants to see them. I can send you copies of the studies that say people are three times more likely to succeed after a restorative justice process than if they went through a cognitive behavioral therapy process and they just did a DOC program. We have a 33% reduction in recidivism when somebody goes through a restorative process. The neurology of that is, if you like brain science, which I love brain science, I was a music teacher, so I love the way people think. I love looking at that. When you are looking at the stages of change, people are three times more likely to change the way they behave when they have heard from the people who have been most affected by their behaviors. If you want to change your behavior because you've been a smoker. You can read all the literature. You can teach a class in how to stop smoking because you know everything there is to know. But when your two-year-old granddaughter looks up at you and says, Grammy, why do you smell? I don't like it when you smoke, Grammy behavior has changed. That'll do it. I, I lost 100 pounds when I couldn't get on the floor with my grandchildren. I knew how to lose weight. I knew how to do it. I could write a book. But when I couldn't get on the floor and my grandchildren said, Graham, come down here and play with us. I was motivated. Change happens when the people around you are able to tell you how it's affecting them. Where do those conversations happen? In the community, there's no place for the victim to sit in the courtroom. The people who are harmed by any criminal activity don't have a voice 
There's no place for them to tell their story. There's no place in the courtroom for the person who did the harm to turn around to the victim and say, I'm really sorry that I did this to you. Sometimes in sentencing, there's an opportunity, rarely. We have victim offender mediation where sometimes the victim just wants to hear that there was something good that came out of this horrible experience that I just had. Let there be something good. This, this person will never do this again because they heard from me how it affected me. In our statutory language, it is the policy of the state of Vermont that principles of restorative justice be included in shaping how the criminal justice system responds to persons charged with or convicted of criminal offenses. The policy goal is a community response to a person's wrongdoing at its earliest onset and a type and intensity of sanction tailored to each instance of wrongdoing. State statute. The policy of DOC, we will resolve conflicts and disputes by means of a non-adversarial community process. We will repair damage caused by criminal acts to communities in which they occur and to address the wrongs inflicted on individual victims. We will reduce the risk of an offender committing a more serious crime in the future that we would require a more intensive and more costly sanction, such as incarceration. Three times more successful when they hear how their behavior has affected the community. We have seen a drop in incarceration over the last 20 years in the state of Vermont we have closed three prisons. The reduction in incarceration has saved the government billions of dollars. We now have 18 restorative justice centers because they pay us to hold the community conversations that need to happen because we are saving them money. Government reciprocity. At my justice center here in St. Johnsbury, we hold neighborhood associations. They first started because we had somebody coming out into a neighborhood and the neighborhood is going, no, 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 you can't let them out in our neighborhood. And so we said, let's gather together. That neighborhood association has been meeting for over 20 years now because people found they like getting together, potlucks, social gatherings, talking with each other. How do we want things to look in our community? We build parks, neighbors are getting together. Uh, we'll get referrals for zoning issues that can't be resolved by the zoning office. We'll get referrals for landlord and, and tenant disputes. We'll get referrals. We have uh, 15 lawyers that offer their services pro bono. We have two lawyers once a month, uh, family law and general law. People can come to our free legal clinic. Um, and then we have our school professional development. We have referrals for mediation. Uh, we also get direct referrals, as I mentioned, our law enforcement agencies will uh, write a re request for somebody to go to our retail theft class, for instance, so they can hear how their retail theft has affected the retail establishment so that they learn not to do that again. And we are getting no trespass orders lifted because people are learning how to repair what was broken how to repair the harm. And retail, we have a grocery store that said, look, it's not that I don't want you to come in and feed your family, it's just I don't want you to steal from me. So they show that they went to the retail theft class, they walk them through that. We have the process where they reintroduce to the store. We have a, a little community eyes on them for a little while till they can be trusted and, and then that build, build up the trust and, and now the retail establishment is saying, okay, yeah, I, I trust that you can you can shop in your store again. People were stealing diapers. It's like, I don't want to steal these diapers. I really want to pay for them, you know? So we, we help people find their way back, lift their chin up just a bit more. And then I have uh, hired a victim support liaison as part of my staff. They look at the um, police report 
Whenever the police re uh, respond to criminal activity, uh, our victim liaison gets the name of the person who was the victim in the crime, calls them within 24 hours and says, we're sorry this happened to you. What can we do to support you? Builds relationship with them right away. Uh, Reparative probation uh, will get referrals from the state's attorney or district attorney or from the court. The judge can send cases directly to us in criminal direct. Um, that can be before conviction. Um, generally, we get the post conviction as a condition of probation. Uh, we might get an administrative probation. So if somebody um, does something like the retail theft, uh, they might be convicted and, and then have just a condition that um, they, they won't be under uh, community supervision. They'll just do, um, somebody will keep track of when they finish their restorative justice program. And then our reentry, um, our reentry coordinator sits down with people. Sometimes it's a COSA. We have eight COSAs going at one time um, throughout the week. That, that's a lot of volunteers. Uh, we train our volunteers to be, you know, the main thing is how do you, how are you a good listener? You know, how do you talk and have conversations and not give advice? <laughs> so that's a lot of our training is around, you know, holding circle and being part of a community circle. So we have, we have volunteers. We have lots and lots of volunteers. And we have lots of partners in this work in the community. So that's enough of my talking and I didn't hear anybody interrupting me, but I might not have given you a chance. <laughs> so, so what questions do you have for me? Well, I have to say I'm in awe. I had no idea that this was a whole statewide re, redoing. And I, I, it sounds like a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so wonderful. And I, I've just, anybody else? Uh, well, I, I think, Susan, you've given us new ideas of how to think, how to envision, how to uh, talk about this whole subject uh, in ways that uh, I didn't even know existed. I mean, this is, I think, an amazing accomplishment. I mean, these are all, this is, uh, you had the word paradigm in there. Uh, this is a whole new paradigm. Mm. Um, and it, maybe it is just being rediscovered because if we had community, um, an active community in the way that we had 150, 200, 500 years ago, uh, we may be more likely to say, oh, I recognize that. But we don't recognize that, uh, that what you do. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Thank you so much for a great number of new thoughts, new ideas, and new concepts, new ways of thinking. I, I wish we could take it, just take it, copy it, plug it right into Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's just, who do you talk to, right? Um, how do you get the word out? <clears throat> and who has the energy, really, to say this is something that is a way to invite people into a conversation that we feel needs to happen? And sometimes it's the money card. Sometimes it's the, uh, in Vermont, it was the overcrowding card. We didn't know what, where to go. But frankly, you know, I, I often say we're in the 100 year plan, uh, you know, on a good day. Sometimes if there are a lot of roadblocks, I'll say we're on the 500 year plan. But one of the things that really, you know, you're thinking about, and, and you mentioned paradigm, the system of justice among our ancestral traditions was not the same system of justice that William the Conqueror brought over here in having the King's justice be our colonial response to harm. The King would say, this has been an offense of the King, throw them in the dungeon. To this day, our district attorney says, this is an offense against the state. And what we're saying is no, it's an offense against the community. 
let's involve the community in finding out how they want to right the wrong. Susan. Yes. Um, how does this work out in your larger cities and towns? You're not a small community that you can sort of draw a circle around a village or a, even a town the size of St. Johnsbury in Burlington. So how does it work there? Well, we have uh, several justice centers in, in Burlington, in, the, in Chittenden County. Um, the idea of representative um, is, is really critical to our work. We're not gathering all the elders together, although that would be an amazing sight. Um, but we are gathering representatives and we invite people to participate as a representative of their community. Um, our neighborhood associations, for instance, are, are, are that way. But the idea originally, when we were first starting this, uh, Vermont has 251 towns. You can become a member of the 251 club and visit all towns in Vermont. 251 justice centers was our original goal because we wanted to have a place where people could repair the harm closest to where that harm happened. And yet we have a court system that is a county system. In Vermont, however, our government is not a county government. So our county system has no money. Our municipalities have the money. So originally the grants went to Winooski, Williston, South Burlington, Burlington. And those centers are still in operation in smaller towns. Burlington is within the police department, is a department of the police department. So they get cases directly from the police as part of the department. Montpelier has their justice center in the municipal offices. And so the director of the Montpelier Justice Center is part of the department head of the municipality of Montpelier. I am a nonprofit because I'm in a very rural area. So I want to be able to cover all of the towns in Caledonia and Southern Essex County, which is a huge geographic area, but not a lot of people, a lot more cows than people in, in Northeast. <laughs> so we, we really do have um, a representative system of government uh, and a representative system of repairing harm. But we always invite more volunteers. The bigger this gets, the more volunteers we need. And um, we have a panel that meets in Barnet, which is a tiny little village south of us, because we have things that happen. There's a little mom and pop store that gets robbed every once in a while. So the people who live in Barnet sit on the panel of those things that happened in Barnet. So we try to have the people represented in that panel process that come from the community closest to where the harm happened. And hi, Matt. Hi. <laughs> hi, Susan. Hi, Robin. My cousins came on. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Robin is the minister at which church in Pennsylvania? Waterford, Pennsylvania, it's Presbyterian the... Church. Wonderful. Any other questions? I know I'm keeping you a bit, but you know, I, I love that uh, that there's a little bit of enthusiasm for seeing a paradigm shift. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're muted, Sue. <laughs> Ducks and bunnies. Um, I think the the most significant shift needs to occur at the very foundation. Um, this focus on punishment, on retribution, on um, making sure that the perpetrator suffers as much or more than the victim. Some of the research I've done lately uh, around mass incarceration and the war on drugs, we had 230,000 people in prison in the 1970s and there actually was a view at that time that prisons might go away. There had been a reduction in the prison population. There were different approaches to the consequences of crime. And there was a 
a body of thought that said if that were to continue, you would only have prisons for the most extreme layer of people. And in every other case, the, uh, the issue of the consequences of crime would be handled some, some other way. We've gone 180 degrees from that. We know that there, we have an order of magnitude more people in prison today than we did then. So it was possible, there was a window then. And there and can think, be a window again. Sure. Um, when your people who run for district attorney stand up and say, I'm tough on crime, then the community needs to respond and say, that's not what we're looking for. Sure. Sure. So and and we, we actually have a district attorney in Delaware now who is looking to address some of the more egregious aspects of our criminal justice system. But to your point, at the very beginning of asking the community what it wants, what's, what's important, and then grounding the work in that. Um, as Sally said, it'd be great to just, you know, plug this in and make it work. It would but it would seem that the most important work is that first step or two that you described to get the key, key parties involved in a dialogue that says, isn't there something else that's better than what we're dealing with right now? We had the wisdom of Madeline Cunin who said, we need a constituency. Yep. And it was that push that said, Let's find out. Because right now, they don't trust us, but we need to find out what do people want. And so you've got the example of Alabama. They did a survey by the same people who did ours, and they ignored it. And if you look at the, the prison system in Alabama, it looks like cages with 100 black men in one little unit. It's, it looks horrible. It's just absolutely, they did not listen to the constituency. They didn't listen. You know, if you're gonna ask the constituency, what do you want? And the community says, we want people to learn how to be better people. Don't put them in jail. What do people learn when they go into jail? Powerful people learn how to be more powerful. You know, I, I, I learn how to be more angry. I learn how to be more aggressive. I learn that nobody is trustworthy. So what do you want to learn from your community? I want to learn I how started, to engage. I started at a point of thinking that what was needed was more rehabilitation in prison. <laughs> but in reality, not going to prison to start with is probably... Um, uh, a better first step in all of that. Yeah. Change is hard, but it's got to start somewhere. And well, this uh, is a lot of times it starts in the schools. This has been wonderful. And one of the real, one of the blessings of this evening is that this is recorded and I I will certainly be offering to share it with a number of people who uh, I hope it piques their, their interest as much as it has mine and I think many people here this evening. And I just can't thank you enough, Susan, for coming and enlightening us and sharing what you've done. And um, I, I'm gonna watch it again too. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just been wonderful. And um, if anybody else has a, a parting, word go ahead but otherwise we'll say good evening and many many thanks thank great, you great thanks thank you it was a pleasure meeting you tonight thank Take you care. Susan. and uh we would like a copy this oh. is from your cousin <laughs> <laughs> so sandy if you can make a copy available to me that would be wonderful okay so, so it'll, be, it'll be available on westminster's youtube channel so anybody will be able to access it from there. And I can send you the link. I'll send, send it to Susan and she can make sure you get Thank it. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Not Westminster Thank you. churches. <laughs> yeah, we'll you. give you the we'll give you the web address and everything. And uh, I'm so glad you joined us as well. Nice to have well, you with us. You. 
Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night.